How's it going, everybody? I'm Josh, amateur radio call sign KI6NAZ, and we are dipping into sub element number four of the technician license privileges test. First, congratulations on showing interest in getting your amateur radio license. It's a lifelong hobby. It's very rewarding, and I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun. If you have questions, hey, that's why my channel's here to help you out. If you click subscribe and the first playlist on my channel is, are you new here or are you new to ham radio? Click here. And uh, there's just a wealth of information that you can start diving into on any questions. And there is no guided way to go about learning amateur radio except to follow what you're interested in. I've always found that to be the best. But let's not belabor the learning any longer. There's a link in the description for a playlist that covers all of the sub elements for the new technician license pool and that will take you into 2026 so get on that learning and studying we're going into sub element four which is amateur radio practices this is broken into two sections so we're going to start with section alpha alpha number one which of the following is an appropriate power supply rating for a typical 50 watt output mobile fm transceiver and the answer for this is 13.8 volts at 12 amperes. Now, generally, when you go onto the market to buy a power supply, you'll find most of them at the entry level point will be about 30 amps, and that's fine. That actually gives you some growth in the future where you can actually run two radios and some other stuff as well. But 13.8, that's the special part. We always want to be generally 13.8 unless your radio specifies differently. Question alpha zero two, which of the following should be considered when selecting an accessory SWR meter? And that SWR is an acronym. It is standing wave ratio. This is used to check the match of the antenna to your transceiver. We're generally aiming for perfection, which is one to one, although perfection is seldom achieved. If you keep it south of three to one, even better if you're below two to one SWR, very nice. You're gonna look for A, the frequency and power level at which the measurements will be made. It took me a second to kick my, my brain into understanding what this was trying to say. So an SWR meter, and they're including power in this as well, usually we include that in the statement, it is an SWR and power meter. You want to buy one that is going to work with the frequencies you're trying to transmit on. That should be obvious, but the question sometimes do need to state stuff like that. And then also the power level that you are transmitting at. So if you look at the previous question, we're talking about a 50 watt transceiver having a 1500 watt power meter for 50 watts, not really needed. You only need one that'll top out at maybe 100 watts, maybe even less than that. So keep that in mind. You'll probably save some money if your SWR power meter is right where you want it to be and also is close to the power range you want to be. When you get to higher power levels, things start to get more expensive, particularly on accessories. Question alpha zero three, why are short heavy gauge wires used for a transceiver's DC power connection? And the answer is A, to minimize voltage drop when transmitting. Alpha zero four, how are the transceiver audio input and output connected in a station configured to operate using FT8? New question for the technician pool in this go around. And the answer is B, to the audio input and output of a computer running WSJTX software. This is really high level, but, but basically it's just saying you got to take the audio in and the audio out of your radio and get it into the audio in and out of your computer. And they're literally switched. So if this is the in, you want it to go to the out of the computer. And if this is the out, you want it to go into the in of the computer. That's how that works, right? Transmits out, goes into the sound cards, receive microphone port, and into the radio is the speaker output of your computer. Alpha 05, where should an RF power meter be installed? So this is the measurement of how much power you're putting out from your transceiver. And that is A, in the feed line between the transmitter and the antenna. That's it. That is where you want it. That's like the last, that's like that last little bit of power, the power that's going out to the antenna, right? You want to measure that as accurately as possible that gets out. Alpha 06, what signals are used in a computer radio interface for digital mode operation? And the answer is C, receive audio, transmit audio, and transmitter keying, like holding the PTT 
on your microphone. Alpha 07, which of the following connections is made between a computer and a transceiver to use computer software when operating digital modes? And the answer is C, computer line in to transceiver speaker connector, which we talked about a little bit already. Alpha 08, which of the following conductors is preferred for bonding at RF? And the answer is D, flat copper strap. Flat strap is the best for grounding and bonding, particularly when you're talking about antennas and your stations, all together devices in which you take to like a ground rod or the appropriate grounding setup as defined by the NEC code. Alpha 09, how can you determine the length of time that equipment can be powered from a battery? We talked about this on last week's uh, after chat. B, divide the battery amp ear hour rating by the average current draw of the equipment. Now, it's saying average current draw because your equipment has a transmit draw number and a receive draw number. So you have to factor in how much time you think you're going to be transmitting versus receiving. I like to be a little heavy handed in my calculations and I'll put it at a 50-50 transmit receive. Generally, you don't do transmitting that often. You're receiving much more like much more of the time. However, when you transmit, the draw is much, much larger than you when you're just receiving. So I like to, uh, I guess, spec up my battery needs a little bit more than what I think I need. Alpha 10, what function is performed with a transceiver and a digital mode hotspot? Another new question. A, communication using digital voice or data systems via the internet. So a hotspot. We talk about those often. Alpha 11, where should the negative power return of a mobile transceiver be connected to a vehicle? And the answer is A, at the 12 volt battery chassis ground. This is sometimes hard to find, but generally when you go in the engine compartment for a vehicle and where your battery sits, there's obviously going to be a positive and negative terminal. But if you follow that negative lead, it will likely lead you to some part of the quarter panel where they've uh, tapped in a line and they have a grounding wire connected. You should actually connect your radio's negative port or negative wire to that ground lug. And then of course the positive goes to the positive on the battery where possible. Alpha 12, what is an electronic keyer? And that's C, a device that assists in manual sending of Morse code. So it's literally a device that goes between your radio and your Morse code key if you're using paddles, for instance. And it, in one example, will help you do, you know, right side DAWs, left side DITs, or vice versa, depending on how you want to have your key set up. What continuity error? All right, so that was section alpha of sub-element four. Let's hop on over to section B. This is for operating controls, frequency tuning, use of filters, squelch function, the AGC, automatic gain control, memory channels, noise blanker, microphone, it goes on. Bravo 01, what is the effect of a excessive mic gain on single sideband transmissions? It's abbreviated as SSB. And that is B, distorted transmitted audio. So you're clipping your microphone you're maximizing all the noise you know that you could put into that microphone and you're you're losing information information that you imparted via your voice try to avoid mic clipping on ham radio and on youtube bravo zero two which of the following can be used to enter a transceiver's operating frequency and that is a the keypad or the vfo knob and literally it's just a big wheel like that or the keypad, which has numbers on it, like that. That's kind of a universal answer because uh, some radios don't really have a big VFO and you're expected to use the keypad and vice versa. Some, there's no keypad at all. Bravo 03, how is squelch adjusted so that a weak FM signal can be heard? And the answer is A, set the squelch threshold so that receiver output audio is on all the time. There you go. So generally, if you're trying to talk to somebody over simplex, you know, radio to radio, you will have to open up that squelch all the way so you just hear the white noise of your background noise floor constantly. And you'll hear them sometimes in the noise, and that's the only way to pull them out in some cases. 
Bravo04, what is a way to enable quick access to favorite frequency or channels on your transceiver? And that is to B, store it as a memory channel. So when we talk about programming our radios like a Baofeng, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about creating memory channels for frequently used frequencies. Bravo05, what does the scanning function of an FM transceiver do? And it's C, tunes through a range of frequencies to check for activity. And that's literally what scanning is going to do. It's going to move through frequencies until it hears an audio signal that's high enough to break squelch and then stop and let you listen. Bravo 06, which of the following controls could be used if the voice pitch of a single sideband signal returning to your CQ call seems too high or too low? And you can use RIT, it's a feature within a lot of radios, or the clarifier. RIT is an acronym, it stands for Receive Increment Tuning. And specifically what it's trying to do is you set your center frequency, which you think there's a station that's listening to you, and they come back and they sound off. They don't sound very human. Maybe they sound like they've been sucking down helium or they sound too low and jarbled. And you use the RIT to adjust the receive frequency, but keep your transmit frequency on the same space. That's generally when you use that. And it's called a clarifier as well. Um, sometimes interchangeably. Bravo 07, what does the DMR code plug and they use quotes, contain B, access information for repeaters and talk groups. This is a, you know, ham radio jargon way of saying radio programming. It's the same kind of idea, except it also adds things like talk groups and station IDs and stuff like that as well. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's radio programming. Bravo 08, what is the advantage of having multiple receive bandwidth choices on a multi-mode transceiver? And B, it permits noise or interference reduction by selecting a bandwidth matching the mode. Yes, if you're using Morse code, your bandwidth needs to be very small. You can filter out a lot of that noise that way versus single sideband needs to be much wider. Bravo 09, how is a specific group of stations selected on a digital voice transceiver? C, by entering the group's identification code. There you go. <laughs> Bravo 10, which of the following receiver filter bandwidth provides the best signal to noise ratio for single sideband reception, abbreviated SSB? And the answer is C, 2400 hertz. That is generally the bandwidth I use when I'm running single sideband. Bravo 11, which of the following must be programmed into a D-star digital transceiver before transmitting? That is your call sign. You also generally have to do this with Yesu System Fusion as well, and uh, D-Star to some degree, which is in the form of your DMR ID. Bravo number 12, the last question in sub-element four. What is the result of tuning an FM receiver above or below a signal's frequency? D, distortion of the signal's audio. Yeah, you're, you're basically sliding off of that transmitting station's frequency and it's gonna sound all kinds of wonky. So there you go. Hey guys, uh, that is sub-element four. As a reminder, we are using hamstudy.org, a great free resource that you can take practice tests. And those practice tests, the more you do, will show you where your weak spots are on some of these sub-elements. And so my advice is watch the videos for the sub-elements that you're having the most trouble with. That will yield you the best results possible and get you on the road to taking your test as fast as possible. If you'd like to flesh out your knowledge on the rest of what these, the backstory of these questions, if you will, go to my channel, hit subscribe, please, but also go to the playlist that says, are you new to ham radio? Click here. And that will help you out a lot. At least I hope it does. Post in the comments if it isn't. I'm Josh, KI6NAZ. Thanks so much for watching. I'll talk to you later. 73.